Godwits are shorebirds, commonly thought of as arctic waders, and like all the arctic waders they belong to the family Scolopacidae, an endearing term which really means it looks a little bit like a snipe. The common terminology for Scolopacidae is now sandpipers, meaning they run along the sand calling or piping a tune. And today we're looking at the Godwits and the early common name for Godwit was derived from the syllable phrasing of the call that the Godwits make. There are four species of godwit, and in Australia we commonly see two, the bar-tailed and the black-tailed. And as the name suggests, they are distinguished by the colouring in the tail. Now godwits are often described as arctic waders, for they breed in the subarctic area, feeding off insects mostly in the tundra, but then, with the harsh winters of the northern hemisphere, migrate south in search of food. The godwits breeding in the northern Scandinavian regions of Western Europe migrate to the UK, Western Europe, and Western Africa. The opposite longitudinal birds that breed in Alaska and Eastern Asia migrate to New Zealand, Australia and Southeast Asia, and those breeding in between go to Southern and Southeast Asia. And these migratory paths are well documented and are called flyways. And as you all know, some of these migratory paths are extremely long. And the godwit has been found flying from Alaska to New Zealand and Alaska to Tasmania as direct non-stop flights. So there is a longitudinal relationship between the origin of the bird and the destination for overwintering. And though we think of these birds as being arctic waders, they in fact spend more time in the overwintering grounds feeding. And today we're going to look at the godwits as they come to Australia. Now please don't regard the godwits as being birds of the arctic or southern hemisphere. They are birds of the flyway, and though they spend considerable time in Australia, they breed in the Arctic, refuelling in Eastern Asia on the journey back to breed. So their territory is not defined by geographic borders, but by the flyway itself. And the flyway connecting Alaska and East Asia to Australia and New Zealand is called the East Asia Australasian Flyway. And the godwits, with many other birds that have hatched in the Arctic, come along this flyway to the east coast of Australia. And it is here that this video is filmed. Godwit standing on a sandbank and now feeding in the mud. The genera name for Godwit is Limosa, from the Latin for mud. For when they come to Australia, mud banks are where they will be found. For this is where the invertebrates live and the invertebrates are what the Godwits feed on. Mostly the shrimp, crustacea, annelids this is in contrast to what happens in Alaska, where the birds, nesting on the tundra, do minimal probing, instead eating the wealth of insects that are available in the subarctic spring. What makes the long distance flight of the Godwit so amazing is not only the 13,500 kilometres in 11 days, but its endurance. The Godwit constantly flaps its wings. We wouldn't be at all surprised if an albatross was to fly this sort of distance. For the albatross rarely flaps its wings, instead it glides on thermals and air current lifts provided by the wave motion. The albatross can swim, but the godwit is not a swimmer and would drown in an open ocean. So it's a physiological thing that the bird can continuously flap its wings for the 11 days. Naturally, they will lose an enormous amount of weight, up to half the body weight. This flight is a miracle of survival. Firstly, in the way the bird navigates for they are extremely faithful, arriving at the same feeding grounds each year. And the young birds also make their way totally independent of the parents. So this migratory ability of the godwit appears to be written by design into their DNA. The other miracle is the physiological process that allows the bird to continuously metabolise the fats to give it energy for this journey without the development of lactic acidosis. It is also suggested that these birds can use hemispherical sleep during the flight. A soft rufous coloured, less contrasting bird, a juvenile probably undertaken the first trip to Australia. It is feeding itself, probing into the mud, and look, it's caught a polychaete or a worm. This shows the characteristic feeding technique of the godwit constantly probing into the mud. At low tide, when the mud banks are exposed, this is the time that they prefer to feed. They will feed with water coming up to the belly, but at high tide, when the water comes up too high, they abandon feeding 
and find a suitable place to roost. So their feeding behaviour is largely determined by the tide. Like most other waders, the godwits are flock birds. Flying together, feeding together, roosting together. And here you can see at low tide when the mangrove roots are exposed, a feeding frenzy happens. With the incoming tide, often the godwits will move to the shoreline and feed there before going into a roosting situation. But when I say shoreline, it needs to be a muddy shoreline, so they aren't found on open beaches where there is sand, but on muddy shores that hold within them the dietary requirements of these birds. So they are found in estuarine areas and brackish coastal lakes. It is only occasional that you will find these godwits on inland lakes. Roosting is usually staged with the birds moving in front of the tide to various roosting sites but even when the tides are sometimes low the birds will go to roost. Either they've had sufficient or there's a paucity of invertebrates in the mud or more simply perhaps they just need a rest. Availability and ability to capture the food depends on several factors. Firstly the water depth but then there is the water temperature. If it is cold many invertebrates will go deeper and once beyond reach of the vibrosensitive tip of the bill, so the birds will stop feeding and look for a roost. Initially they are happy roosting with their feet in water, but with a long high tide they do like to get into a roosting site where their feet are dry. Thousands of soldier crabs on the beach, godwits walking around, but yet the godwits are still probing. They are after something else, another crustacean or a worm. It is rare for godwits to eat soldier crabs like this. Now I've referred to this previously on the video of Eastern Curlew. Now the nutritional value of a soldier crab has been analysed and it's very much like any other crustacean. Yet the Arctic waders rarely feed on them. Overall I suspect sandpipers, including the godwits, need to sense the organism in the mud with their vibrosensitive organ to give rise to the pleasure of eating. And this is what happened a moment ago. The godwit pulled the soldier crab from a burrow before eating it. But there may be other factors, like does the soldier crab carry eggs? Feeding on crabs like this fiddler crab is far more common. Before going into a roosting phase, most of the godwits, like other birds, will spend time bathing and preening. As this godwit preens, you can see the magnificent barring over the tail of this bird giving rise to its name, the bar-tailed godwit. Now the bill of a godwit has a little bit of an upturn, but here I want to show you how this relatively straight bill can have an upward flexion movement. We usually think of the bill as being rigid, but indeed it does move. And this movement is called rhenchokinesis, and I suspect this is a factor that helps different sandpipers select different invertebrates. So on a mud bank where all the birds are feeding, there is tolerance of one species to the next, despite the fact they're all chasing mollusca, crustacea and annelids. I have never seen bill bending in the curlews with a long curved bill, and it seems to be a factor only in the birds with a long straightish bill, like the dowager and the godwin. With this group of birds, you can see that they are getting some colour in them. It's coming to March, the end of summer has been, and now the birds are thinking about returning back to their breeding grounds. Here, they are standing in the water, resting, but you can see some birds have gone into a brick red colour. I will now put up some still shots, showing various phases of the bar-tailed godwit on the east coast of Australia. On arrival from Alaska, they are thin and feather-worn, on foreshore roosting you can see they are thin, emaciated birds. Some have even lost primary flight feathers. They are accompanied by young with the more pale rufous appearance. Young have had to tend for themselves both in flight and in feeding and occasionally they are lucky enough to catch a fish. Grouping as a flock this helps them to find the best feeding grounds. They feed only on mud banks, chasing invertebrates. The godwits feed and fatten, getting ready for the return flight back to Alaska. 
With this new look, they colour up, taking on the terracotta-coloured breeding plumage, in readiness for the mating rituals that will happen in the coastlines of Eastern Asia. Apart from size, where the female is a little bit bigger than the male with the godwits, it's hard to distinguish a male from a female, but as they go into full breeding plumage, the male will develop a far more intense terracotta colour that extends right down over the belly of the bird. As the Australian days get shorter and colder, so the godwits think more of flying back to warmer weather. So before winter comes, they take off heading north. It is not as arduous as the southern migration, for they will have a soiree and a feeding stopover at the Yellow Sea to get that final revitalisation before reaching the subarctic and raising a new family. A few birds, mostly those without colour, will remain and overwinter in Australia. Well, up till now, we've mostly looked at the bar-tailed godwit. Let's now have a brief look at the black-tailed godwit. Here a close-up view in flight of the bar-tailed and the black tail. Here's the black tail, and you can see the tail is black. There is white underwing with the leading dark edge. The bar-tailed has the bar-tailed. Surprise, surprise. And there is size variation. The black-tailed bird is smaller than the bar-tailed. Often they will fly together as a mixed flock, and the edges of the underwing of the black-tailed are dark. And also you can see the feet hanging out beyond the tail of the bird. The remaining birds in this clip are bar-tailed godwits. And here, the black-tailed in flight. And you can see as they fly off, there is a white mark down the upper surface of the wing. And this is fairly diagnostic in combination with the black tail that is far more visible in flight. The black circle shows some bar-tails also flying in this flock and they are a much lighter bird with a fawn colour. Another mixed flock with the black tail godwits being highlighted to show the difference from the bar tailed. And a detailed view of the black tail godwit. When not in flight, the black tailed bird is a little bit more difficult to separate from its bar tailed friend, for the black tail is concealed. But overall, the bird is a little bit more grey, giving it a very soft look, so it doesn't have the contrasting look that the bar-tailed has. Another comparison of black and bar-tailed in breeding mode. The black-tailed bird, with breeding plumage, develops barring over the chest. In terms of eating and behaviour, the black-tailed and the bar-tailed are identical. Here coming into roost and having a bath, you can see the black tail with white contrasting rump of these godwits. Statistically, one is always biased in Australia to say the bird is a bar tail, for they are far more common than the black tailed bird. Just watch this black tail godwit walk through amongst the bar tails, and you can see the softer appearance. It is a darker and a smaller bird than the bar tailed. Though it is a black tailed bird, we can't see the black tail, so this is not a good point of identity unless the bird opens the wings like in flight. A group of godwits roosting on the shore. The black tail in breeding mode has significant barring over the chest, and this won't be present in the bar tailed breeding bird. When it comes to breeding plumage, the black tailed birds tend to colour up a little bit earlier than the bar tailed. Black tail strolling along the intertidal area. Notice how again there is that very soft appearance to the black tailed, especially noticeable in the head and neck region. Usually there is species grouping within a flock of shorebirds, but not always. Here there are black tail and bar tails together. As they move around, you'll be able to pick the black tails for the black tail, the white stripe on their wing, the smaller size, and the softer appearance. The black tail godwits are born in Siberia and northern Mongolia. Their migratory path south is staged, going to Southeast Asia, Indonesia and then Australia. They don't have the single non-stop flight, as we mentioned for the Alaskan bar-tailed godwit. Now a side-by-side -side comparison with the smaller black-tailed godwit on the left-hand side and the bar tail to the right.
A flock of Bartow Godwoods coming up onto the shore to roost as the tide is coming in. And a small group of Blacktail Godwoods still out in the water. But with the continuing incoming tide, they need to move. They gradually fly into the dry roosting site, but when they alight, they still come together so that the Blacktails are all in one small group within the flock. And overall, they get on in a harmonious way, despite the fact that they are different species. Here with this last shot, I will leave you with a nice image of a black-tailed godwit amongst the bar-tailed group. I now hope that when you look at a group of godwits, you will be able to individually identify the species. On behalf of Plumes of Oz, thank you for watching this video. We do hope you've enjoyed it. And please hit the subscribe button and bell to get notification of further releases of Australian birds in the wild.